So my name is Anatole Winscott, and I'm the Member Experience Manager here at CrossRep. I work as part of the Member and Community Outreach Team, and it's my pleasure to talk to you a bit about participation reports. Today I will show you how you can easily track what metadata you're registering with CrossRef, why you should be checking the report regularly, how to interpret the reports, and how to improve your metadata coverage levels. Um, these webinars are run regularly, and uh, today my colleagues Paul Davis and Isaac Farley from our support team are here as well um, on the webinar to help me with any questions while I'm presenting. So before we start, um, maybe I'll go over a bit of housekeeping. You can submit any questions through the Q&A uh, function uh, in Zoom or through the chat, and we'll try to get to them while I'm presenting, or you can wait until we're done with the webinar, and then we can um, you can raise your question, you can ask your question, um, or you can also submit it through chat, and we'll uh, try to answer it for you. Okay, but before we jump in, I'm going to share a quick poll with you. Hopefully it'll work. Um, let's see, where is my, okay. Oh, um, nope, my poll today is not working, I apologize. Oh, actually it is. Um, it just came up in another window, I apologize. So what you should be seeing um, soon is a question, um, and this is not going to be on the recording, I don't think, but a question that says, all the metadata I collect is automatically sent to Crossref. So if you could answer this poll right now, I'll give everyone a minute to, um, and we'll see what the answers are soon. Okay, it looks like most of you have answered. So I'm going to share the results with you now. And it looks like not sure is um, the answer, the, the, um, the one with the largest percentage. So please keep this in mind. Um, I'm going to uh, come back to this in a little while in the, um, in the webinar. Okay. So what, um, I'll go ahead now and tell you a, a bit about the reports. So what are the reports? They are a place where you can check what metadata you're registering with Crossref. Um, they are open and free to use by anyone. Uh, they allow you to track the levels of metadata over time. So this is handy if you're using service providers or if you're not directly responsible for registering the metadata yourself. Uh, perhaps uh, someone on the production team is and um, you don't have access to that information all the time. Um, so it's an easy place to just check what's going on. And they allow members to see how they measure up to um, other members to see where the gaps are and see where they can be improved. They're about two years old now. We launched them in the summer of 2018 and we're hoping to improve them. So if you have any feedback, please let us know. So you may be wondering why we developed these reports. Well, they came about mainly because we have been hearing from our members that they're not always sure what metadata they're registering with us. Um, so we assume that most of our members knew exactly what they were sending us, but that's not always the case. So we decided to make it easier um, for everyone, including ourselves, to see what metadata was being registered. Um, this data has always been available um, or for quite some time through our REST API, but not everyone uh, knows how to query the API. It's not as user-friendly and it's more geared towards machines than humans. And then um, another reason for the participation reports was that it made it easier for our members to see what was missing um, and to fill in the gaps and to update their metadata. Um, and lastly, the reports um, 
help allow our members to track their progress to see what you know what they have updated um, is actually reflected in Crossref. And this brings us back to our poll at the beginning of the webinar. You're not um, you, you think you may be sending something to Crossref, but um, a lot of you were not sure exactly what. So the participation reports are a great tool um, to see what you're actually sending us. So where does um, the metadata in Crossref actually end up? Um, so a variety of different tools use Crossref's metadata because Crossref's metadata is standardized and machine readable. It is very useful to many different organizations that make your content more discoverable um, and uh, you know, available to researchers. So it's, it's quite important to share as much as you possibly can because it helps in building these co collaborative tools. Okay, so when you are registering your metadata, it's also very important to keep in mind that the metadata is correct, that there are no errors and typos, that it's complete, that all of the fields that you can manage are registered, not just the first author, but all of the author's uh, publication dates, anything that's not required. Um, so ask your authors for ORCID identifiers, and if you have funding data, register that with us as well, Fund, funder IDs and grant numbers. Um, in the future, you'll be able to register ROAR IDs, which are um, help uh, with the affiliation uh, information issue, so um, will help identify um, academic institutions, um, and make sure that your metadata is up to date. Um, so talk to your vendors or your production teams and make sure that um, everything that you're sending us is up to date and that it is updated if you have um, any metadata to update um, that it's done as well. And once you update your metadata, you can expect to see it reflected in the participation report in about 24 hours and all updates are free of charge. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how um, it, they actually work, the participation reports. So I'm gonna click on this uh, URL and I'll also paste it in for everyone into the chat window if I can find it, sorry. Uh, let's see. Here we go. So you can, um, you can also look up your um, organization. And today I'm going to look at National Institute of for Health Research, actually. And it should come up as you're typing. Um, it's right there. Um, and you will be taken to this main uh, page of the reports. And today is um, a slow day for the reports. I apologize, it should load. Um, but it is a little bit on the slow time. Here we go. Um, so this is where you kind of will end up when you type in your organization name. And if you find that you mistyped or you went to the wrong uh, report, you can always go back to find a member and start again. Um, so that's how you get, kind of get back to another report. I apologize. We're going to, it's going to load again for a bit. And on this page, you will see um, total registered content items next to your organization's name. Um, what this means is that it's all of the DOIs that are registered. Um, however, they um, you need to make sure that the time, the, the date range dropdown, which has three different selections, um, is selected to all time if you want to see all of your DOIs. So. Um, uh, this total registered content items changes as you change the date dropdown. So this particular member has over 2,700 DOIs registered with us for uh, three different types of content, reports, journal articles, and data sets. Um, we're going to look at current content items because that's the most recent. And that um, current content this year is anything published in 2018 
2019 and 2020. Uh, next year, that will change, of course, um, but that's the most uh, recent content um, that has been registered. And I selected this member because they have amazing coverage for their, um, they don't have too many articles, but um, their, you know, their metadata is very rich, um, something to aspire to for many, um, many publishers, which is amazing. Um, and I wanted to kind of walk through the report um, using this example. If you select backfile, backfile just shows you everything that was published prior to current content. So this year, anything published before 2018. So it goes, it can go as far back as um, your, you know, um, the older the content that you have. Um, I think our oldest content maybe from the 1400s or maybe even, yeah, I think 1400s. Um, so let's go back to current content. On the other side of the report, you can select what um, content type you'd like to look at. Uh, defaults to journal articles or the, the main content type that you register. So if you were registering books and book chapters, that would be the one that you would kind of see when you came to this um, main page of the reports. Uh, so in this particular example, journal articles are the main one. And if you have several journals, this particular publisher has one, I think, but, um, uh, oh, no, several, they have several as well. Um, you can select the journal type as well, um, the journal title, and just look at a specific journal and not um, at it holistically as well. And I apologize for uh, the loading today, the something's going on, I think, because um, it's a little slow, or it could be my internet um, as well. Uh, so this is just an example of uh, one of the journal titles and the coverage for it um, that you can see. But let's look at the whole organization or the organization as a whole. Um, the first thing that you will see um, is these 10 key elements that we have listed here, and they have percentages next to them. So what this means is that um, the percentage is uh, how many DOIs contain a certain key element. So in this case, 100% of the 414 current content uh, articles, um, DOIs of the articles contain references in the metadata. So these references are citations that you would register as part of your metadata. And it's quite important to register uh, your reference lists in Crossref. Um, because especially because if you want to participate in cited by which shows which publishers are citing your content um, and you can display that information um, you need to register your references and it also gives researchers a vital data point through which to find your content so it's it's quite um, quite important another reason is that it um, helps with dissemination and you know building upon knowledge um, of um, of uh, research so uh, there are many you know different reasons uh, where registering your references is quite useful and beneficial to um, science so open references is just um, whether the references that you registered are actually, set to um, be shared across all of our APIs and services. Um, currently, when you join Crossref, I think for the last two years, your references are open by default. So you should see 100% if you joined in the last two years. But if you've joined prior to that, um, you had a choice of setting them to limited, so not open to across all of our APIs. Um, and if you find that you have a zero or like 99 or any other number than 100% and you'd like to share your references, please let us know and we can easily open them up and make them available across all of our APIs. Uh, ORCID identifiers uh, just help disambiguate author names. So if you're not collecting um, ORCIDs from your authors, you should start. Um, they're free to get and we offer a service called auto update uh, to authors where we can push any of the publications that have a DOI and that uh, you know the author has an ORCID to their ORCID profile pages. So 
they can easily um, display their publications on their ORCID profile page or ORCID record page. And in this case, 92% of the 414 um, journal articles have at least one author um, per article with an ORCID. Funder registry IDs, um, we have a funder um, a registry with funder names and you can select the funder ID and include it in your metadata. And in this case, 100% of their articles contain funder registry IDs. Um, also funding award numbers um, or grant numbers, if you have them, you can include them. It's really important, especially for funding organizations. Um, it helps them analyze um, sources of funding and ensure that um, uh, they can comply, publishers can comply with funder mandates. So it is important um, to uh, a variety, for a variety of different reasons. And if you're ever wondering, if you're looking at this report and you forget like, what is this about? You can always hover over the little eye um, and it will tell you exactly what you're looking at um, and why it's important. There are links to our um, curriculum pages, education pages, uh, where you can browse and read about all of these key elements um, in more detail. Crossmark enabled just means that you are registering Crossmark metadata. Um, and Crossmark is a service that allows you to show whether um, your content has um, been updated since publication. So if there is a major correction or even a retraction, you can indicate that in the metadata. Um, it makes it quite useful for um, your readers. Um, so I would encourage everyone to um, use Crossmark. There's no extra fee for it. Um, so you can um, submit metadata as you would for any of the other things that you're seeing here. None of this metadata costs any, um, anything extra to register. Um, next up, we have three sets of URLs. So text mining URLs, license URLs, and similarity check URLs. Um, each one has a different purpose. Uh, text mining URLs, you can include your full text URLs for the purposes of text and data mining. So um, if you find that you have a lot of um, requests from researchers um, for text and data mining, you can make your life easier and their life easier by including full text URLs in your metadata. Of course, the access is um, uh, figured out on between you and the researcher and like, you know, libraries, some publishers have um, um, special uh, agreements um, with researchers and libraries. And if your content is open access, then you don't have to worry about that. Um, next up, you can include um, a variety of different licenses. Um, one, for example, can spell out the terms of text and data mining. So if you wanted to include text and data mining licenses that pertain to the full text URL that you included in your metadata, you can include it here. If, um, or you can also include open access licenses or any type of license. So even if it's not um, open access, you can indicate that uh, like with a copyright license, you can include those licenses and that's um, quite important as well. Many researchers query on that field and lastly, similarity check URLs. If you're participating in our a service called similarity check, which allows you to check for potential um, plagiarism, you can include full text uh, URLs for the purposes of indexing by Authenticate, our um, technology partner uh, that provides the um, technology for uh, the plagiarism uh, detection or plagiarism checking. And you are um, able to um, include any of your content to be indexed and included in their database so that others can check against it. Um, and it's a requirement if you're participating in the service. And you can also, even if you're not participating in similarity check, um, but don't mind doing that, um, you can do that as well. And then uh, lastly, we have abstracts. Um, just recently, um, I-40A, um, uh, Crossref um, had um, announced that um, uh, I-40A, um, which is the Initiative for Open Abstracts, 
um, has joined kind of forces with Crossref and we're hoping to let, you know, spread the word and um, let publishers know that they can include abstracts in the metadata. And in this particular case, 99% um, of their DOIs have abstracts. And it's great um, because it gives your researchers more context um, and helps, of course, making your um, uh, content more discoverable. So if you have abstracts and you would like to share them, um, you can do that through uh, Crossref metadata. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour. Um, I just wanted to show you another quick example of a publisher with different types of metadata. So, um, and hopefully it won't take too long to load. Okay. Yeah. And it's not coming up. Oh, yes, here we go. So this is Wiley, a very large publisher, but they have different types of content. So it's a great example just to show you um, that usually journal articles will have the most metadata registered. Um, and for example, book chapters, which we're hoping, you know, and books. Um, so if you're a book publisher, uh, you can include extra metadata for um, that content type as well. Um, and these are the different types of uh, key elements that can be included for um, book chapters. Um, books are listed here. And you will see that, you know, some of the different content types might not have all of the key elements um, that you can register. Conference papers, for example, are like um, journal articles. So they have all of the 10 key elements that we, um, um, we uh, include for, um, you can include for journal articles as well. So if you do uh, publish conference papers, I encourage you to register more met metadata with us. Um, and then of course there are data sets um, and preprints as well. Um, so this is just uh, an example of uh, how you can, um, you know, register other content than just uh, journal articles. And of course, if you, um, if you ever look at your report, um, even if you're sending us a lot of metadata, it's probably going to be better for the current content than for the back files. So usually the back files are much, much uh, lower because you might have more content, it might be older, it might be harder to get, for example, references out from older content, so don't worry. Um, we do just you know, encourage you to start with your current content and get in as much um, metadata as possible for the current content. And if you can ever go back and, um, you know, do a whole kind of uh, back file um, uh, re-registration, um, then that would be great. Um, but it's not required. And of course, some of you might not have all of the key elements. So if you're in the humanities, social sciences, you might not have um, some of these, um, like for example, funder registry IDs, um, or uh, maybe some of your authors uh, have never heard of ORCIDs. Um, so just something to keep in mind um, uh, that you know, if you don't have it, of course, you're not gonna be able to register it with us. But if you have it, um, I do encourage you to do so. So let's see, I think I might have another um, let's see, poll for us. I just took screenshots of this um, for the presentation, so you will you'll be able to see it. Yes. So I have an activity uh, for us. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording now, and um, let's see.